Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, would be most appreciative if everyone here in-house will check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. It's always helpful for those recording our events today. Uh, we will, of course, post the program on the Heritage website for your future reference, and our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Michaela Dodge, Policy Analyst for Defense and Strategic Policy in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. She specializes on missile defense, nuclear weapons modernization, and arms control. She holds a Master's of Science degree in Defense and Strategic Studies from Missouri State University, where she was awarded the Ulrich Schumacher Memorial Scholarship for two years. She received a bachelor's degree in international relations and defense and strategic studies from the Marisk University in the Czech Republic. She serves as a national security fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and is a former Publius fellow at the Claremont Institute. She also participates in the Project on Nuclear Issues, Nuclear Scholars Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Please join me in welcoming Michaela Dodge. Michaela. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, John, and thank you all for coming. Um, if you haven't had a chance to grab a copy of Nuclear Weapons and the Future of National Insecurity, please do so. The copies are available outside. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists in order in which they speak today, and later we will be joined by Mr. Fortenberry, who had a slight change of schedule. Uh, our first panelist is Rebecca Heinrichs, who is a visiting fellow here at Heritage. Um, she focuses on nuclear deterrence and missile defense issues, and prior to her time at Heritage, she managed the House Missile Defense Caucus as a legislative assistant to Representative Trent Franks. She received her Master of Arts degree in National Security and Strategic Policy from the U.S. Naval War College. She graduated with highest distinction and was the recipient of the Director's Award for Academic Excellence. She holds a Bachelor of Arts from Ashland University and is an Ashbrook um, Scholar. Um, so our second speaker, uh, Guy Roberts, is currently an independent consultant at GBR Consulting. He is also a retired Marine with 25 years in the service, and thank you for your service. Um, following his military career, Mr. Roberts served uh, at the U.S. Department of the Navy as legal advisor in arms control and nonproliferation issues. He worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense um, Policy as Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and Principal Director for Negotiations Policy. Most recently, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Weapons of Mass Destruction Policy and Director um, and Nuclear Policy Planning Directorate for the NATO. Um, he formulated policy related to WMD proliferation, missile defense, and NATO's overall nuclear posture. Um, Tom Schieber, our third panelist, is currently Vice President of the National Institute for Public Policy. He works on deterrence strategic concept and strategic far force posture analysis. Mr. Schieber served as a naval officer and aviator in the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service, Tom. Um, and served at, uh, on the Los Alamos National Laboratory staff as a director of the military applications group and project leader for weapons studies. During George W. Bush administration, Mr. Schieber worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense Policy um, in forces policy, where he held a central role in the DOD's implementation of the Nuclear Posture Review. He also served as the Director for Strike Policy and Integration. He was responsible for developing policy according to the President and Secretary of Defense's Strategic Forces Guidance. Mr. Schieber holds a Master's Degree of Science in Operations Research from the Naval Postgraduate School and received his Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from the U.S. Naval Academy. He holds the Secretary of Defense Medal for Meritorious Public Service Award. And with that, Rebecca, I'll start with myself. Sure. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, so great to see such a packed audience on such an important topic, so thank you for being here. 
Um, what I'd like to do is kind of give a little bit of background about where we are and the direction that the administration is kind of going on our nuclear force and talk about the purpose of this pamphlet um, and what we hope uh, to accomplish with it. In June of this year, the President announced that the U.S. would pursue further cuts, this is after the New START treaty cuts, going down from 1,550 uh, strategic deployed nuclear weapons down to 1,000, which is a one-third uh, cut. The White House released a white paper explaining the Obama administration's plans, and it said that the President directed the Department of Defense, the State Department, the Energy Department, and the intelligence community to first conduct a detailed, serious, robust analysis of the threat um, and then from that information then develop um, uh, plans for what our nuclear force should look like. It assured us in this White House document that this review was based on the principle that a robust assessment of today's security, environment, and resulting presidential guidance must drive the nuclear employment planning force structure and posture decisions. It went on to defend its commitment to the nuclear force, asserting that the president has supported significant investments in modernization, to the nuclear enterprise and to maintain a safe, secure, and effective arsenal. Then in the accompanying employment strategy document, um, it gave a little bit more detail, and it said that it was uh, committed to the triad, and even stated that the new guidance requires that the U.S. maintain significant counterforce capabilities against potential adversaries. It was very clear that the new guidance does not rely on countervalue or minimum deterrence strategy. I thought this was incredibly important that the administration wanted to make that clear. So, three points. The, uh, the administration supports a ro it used a robust assessment of the threats first, and that is what drove uh, the numbers and force structure. This is what, um, according to the administration. Number two, that the current nuclear force will be modernized and that the triad will be maintained. And number three, that we will continue to maintain a counterforce capability. In other words, we are going to lower numbers, but if you like your deterrence, you can keep it. <laughs> but as we uh, kind of look at the numbers and look at what the administration has said um, and kind of look at their actions, we can see a different story. And this is kind of the purpose of this pamphlet. Um, we tried to kind of go through and show, according to the administration's own words, what they support, and then try to actually show what they've done. Um, so first, as the president would like us to believe that the administration's various departments only came to the conclusion that we'd go to low numbers after a security assessment, we can see that that's actually not true. In 2012, the president himself said, the study is underway, but even as we have more work to do, we can already say with confidence that we already have more nuclear weapons than we need, <coughs> end quote. Senior administ administration officials suggest that the president had already made his decision before the study was completed. Tom Donilon, his national security advisor at the time, made the same point in 2011. He said, as we implement New START, we're making preparations for the next round of nuclear reductions. This is before they conducted their study. But a serious and honest threat assessment would certainly conclude that America's foes are actually emphasizing nuclear weapons in their security strategies. Russia is increasing its reliance on nuclear weapons um, and, its and in its military doctrine, even according to Obama administration officials. Its rhetoric is increasingly provocative, even to the point of threatening the preemptive employment of nuclear weapons out of an opposition to uh, the deployment of purely defensive weapons, the United States missile defense systems in Europe. <coughs> and China, um, as you probably saw, just re as recently as last month, illustrated in state-run media outlets what a nuclear strike on the US would look like, and in some instances, how many casualties would occur. And tensions continue between the U.S. and these two powers over the influence in the Middle East and in the Pacific. It would be foolish to assume that because the United States is not in a direct conflict with them now that we will not be in the future. And that planning on what our nuclear force would look like now won't have an effect on our relationship with them in the future. On the second point regarding the President's um, supposed commitment to modernizing the force we currently have in place, between fiscal years 2012 and 2016, the president will have underfunded our nuclear weapons infrastructure by, by about $1.4 billion. As former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said, quote, the U.S. is the only declared nuclear power that is neither modernizing its arsenal nor has the capability to produce a new nuclear warhead. China and Russia have embarked on an ambitious path to design and field nuclear weapons, end quote. Moreover, the administration has revealed its plans to eliminate a squadron of ICBMs, and my colleague Michaela just recently did an issue brief on that, and you can check that out on the Heritage website. 
and the administration has requested funds for an environmental assessment of, redu of ICBM reductions in its fiscal year 2014 budget request. And it says the pretext for doing so is that it's, it's doing this to accommodate the New START Treaty, but the New START Treaty actually does not require um, removing ICBM silos. On the last point about the administration's claim it is not relying on countervalue or minimum deterrent strategy, the administration's argument for going to lower numbers have all the hallmarks of a minimum deterrence policy and ultimately lead to a countervalue strategy. And those points are just, the, um, just, just to name a few. Number one, that deterrence works at very low numbers, so we can go to very low numbers and, and have an adequate deterrence. Um, and that nuclear parity, and actually, uh, we know that nuclear parity, in fact, may be provocative. As General Robert Kaler once said, it is not possible to accurately determine the precise level or conditions at which the PRC leadership might elect to attempt to match U.S. nuclear inventory. In other words, as the United States actually goes down to lower numbers rather than encouraging others to do the same, we might actually see countries like China um, see an opportunity to actually increase the number of nuclear weapons in their force to match the United States. Number two, that the U.S. no longer needs to deter peers like China and Russia because rogue states are the number one threat. We already discussed that that's just not true. And number three, that the U.S., as, as the U.S. decreases its nuclear weapons, countries either stop pursuing nuclear weapons or will decrease their numbers of nuclear weapons and stability is strengthened. The U.S. has been steadily decreasing the number of its nuclear weapons over the years and hasn't tested nuclear weapons since the 90s. And yet countries continue to modernize their forces and states like Iran are still in determined pursuit of gaining a nuclear weapons capability. In conclusion, the administration continues to pursue Global Zero and it's chipping away at the U.S. nuclear force. But Global Zero should not be the goal. Peace and security should be the goal. And this is best achieved if the United States maintains a nuclear force that is second to none. That it's survivable, flexible in order to meet contemporary and future security challenges and convinces friends and foes alike that the threat of employment is credible. As much as the administration would like us to believe that is maintaining this kind of force, its actions actually prove otherwise. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Now, U.S. is not the only nuclear weapon state or the only state that relies on U.S. nuclear weapons. So I'm looking forward to Guy's remarks on why, why U.S. nuclear weapons are also important for others, not just the U.S. Well, thank you, Michaela, and thank you again. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I hope that, uh, I, I guess this is being recorded. Yes. So I hope the, uh, the video version works because the sunshine or the light shining on top of my head tends to distort the difference. So <laughs> I always have to sit in the back. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, my focus in the short time that we have is uh, on my experience at, at NATO uh, and, I, and the importance of not only our extended nuclear deterrence posture there, but the importance uh, and the ramifications of U.S. nuclear presence in Europe and how the burden sharing and consultative processes are so important to the alliance. And that's what I want to focus on. Now, I am having a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> but the reason for that is I it's a couple of slides that I help you understand the process that we go through at NATO in arriving at our current um, nuclear posture and policy. So uh, I'll get right into it. First part is a statement by a former uh, defense minister uh, from the UK, which I think is still relevant uh, even today. He was, of course, referring to the Cold War era, difficulty of convincing our NATO uh, allies of the credibility of the U.S. extended uh, deterrence commitments. But I would submit to you that that even holds true uh, today, uh, and that one of the very, very important aspects of maintaining a U.S. nuclear presence in Europe is its manifestation as of U.S. commitment to, to the alliance. Uh, and, and by the way, this is, I think, uh, to a certain extent, because one of the lessons learned when I was at NATO is how important and how concerned uh, other U.S. allies are regarding U.S. security commitments to NATO. I was uh, visited many times by South Korean ambassadors and Japanese ambassadors and deputy chiefs of mission uh, asking the question constantly about is there going to be a change in NATO's nuclear deterrence posture and what those potential changes might have uh, an impact to uh, U.S. security commitments for them. Uh, before I go into that, I, I think one of the points I wanted to make is, is that you know NATO is in trouble. I mean, we, we have uh, serious issues regarding 
defense budgets. Frankly, most Europeans don't think about security. Uh, they don't see a security threat. Uh, that's part of the reason why uh, defense budgets are in free fall. Uh, even though we have a political commitment uh, from the nations to spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense, we are below 1.5% and falling. As many as nine countries in NATO will spend less than 1% on uh, defense. But at the same, and, and the security concerns that the United States has met, as, as ex expressed, particularly regarding Iran, doesn't reverberate much in, in Europe. Uh, nevertheless, there is a continuing concern uh, regarding the U.S. political commitment, um, and those are reflected in the announcement regarding the Asia pivot, so-called pivot the um, unwillingness uh, in certain respects to exercise U.S. leadership and uh, the reduction of U.S. conventional forces. So even if you could make the argument that reduction in uh, nuclear forces could somehow be compensated by a conventional force uptick, uh, that's just not happening. In fact, uh, we will, uh, by 2015, be down to less than 37,000 uh, troops in Europe, which, of course, is uh, a fraction of what we had during the height of the Cold War. So, uh, this nice little cartoon. Got to have a cartoon. Uh, we went through in a nuclear posture review, um, uh, basically first making the statement that, uh, as you see here, the presence of U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe continue um, to contribute to alliance cohesion, and that any changes in NATO's nuclear posture would only be taken take place after a thorough review within the alliance. And that review started with the uh, Lisbon uh, summit uh, endorsement and adoption of the 2010 strategic uh, concept. Um, that strategic concept basically endorsed the continued presence of U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe as an important commitment by the United States to the alliance's security. But as a part of that, um, we recognized that uh, there needed to be, the, as part of the alliance, uh, looking at the totality of the force structure, that NATO, we needed to look at NATO's um, uh, commitment to not only nuclear weapons, but to the conventional forces and to missile defense. Um, part of the strategic concept, again, took great pains to stress the indivisibility of security, uh, U.S. commitments to that security, and that a palpable demonstration of that commitment is the presence of U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe. Um, part of the problem for our allies is that, and the concern, despite very strong statements by certain foreign ministers that the United States should remove their nuclear weapons from Europe, is the fact is just that fact number one is by doing so would it diminish u.s security commitments secondly what would be the role of the allies in any future uh, nuclear mission and what would be the responsibilities and burden sharing of carrying out that mission if it continues to be relevant to alliance security and so we embarked on a two-year process after uh, the strategic concept was adopted in something called the Deterrence and Defense Posture Review. Um, that review, uh, as I said, took two years. Um, it involved um, a number of working groups, uh, a number of discussions that occurred at the North Atlantic Council level, and I, it's important that I talk a little bit about the process because uh, time and time again you will hear statements to the effect that, well, the Alliance didn't consider all the ramifications, didn't consider all of the, the possibilities, if you will. And in fact, that is just not the case. We had a series of working groups. We had uh, experts come in and actually brief the North Atlantic Council. Uh, we had discussions at the defense ministerial level, the foreign ministerial level, and, and trying to assess what is our, what should our deterrence and defense posture be. And so anyone that says, well, you didn't really consider all the options or, you know, looking, including at the possibility of, uh, of taking those weapons completely out of Europe is just flat wrong. That's not the way it worked. But you will continue to hear uh, people make those particular statements. 
So what were the results? Well, the results were, again, um, endorsing the concept of burden sharing and consultation. And those are two key elements on the part of our allies. Uh, a firm belief that they need to share the burden in some way, shape, or form, which is challenging particularly for our new allies uh, that joined NATO uh, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, given the fact that there are limitations on their employment of nuclear weapons in their territories. And secondly, this consultation process. Um, all the way back to 1962 in something called the Athens Guidelines, the United States agreed that in any uh, situation in which nuclear weapons would be potentially used, the U.S. agreed to consult with the Allies before uh, they would consider uh, potentially using them. Uh, that consultation process is very, very important, uh, and the Allies continue to express their their interest in having that particular role to play. I might mention that every single ally that joined, uh, the new allies that joined, m mentioned that a key element for joining was, in fact, the extended deterrence umbrella that's provided by U.S. nuclear nuclear forces. Uh, again, there was a, a re-endorsement of the cohesion and solidarity uh, regarding the overall deterrence posture um, that, in fact, burden sharing includes uh, sharing the costs, uh, both financial and political, uh, for having those weapons in, uh, in Europe. The basic conclusion is, as you see here, that uh, when we went through the process, the concern was and the focus was on how we would bolster and strengthen deterrence and our security. And the option, the global zero option, if you will, didn't bolster or strengthen deterrence and security. And, and that was the conclusion that all the nations came to, uh, including those that in public statements have said, well, we should get rid of nuclear weapons in Europe. We should get rid of the U.S. nuclear weapons in Europe. Let me show you uh, briefly how the process uh, looks. Um, this is, you know, sometimes people look at the NATO, um, how we make our decisions, and it's somewhat opaque. This is the nuclear groups that look at um, the nuclear issues uh, in the Nuclear Deterrence and Defense Posture Review. Um, okay. No memorandums? No, no. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, the, in addition to these groups you see here, we had the North Atlantic Council at the ambassador level actively participating in discussions. The Nuclear Planning Group is at the defense ministerial level, so defense ministers sit and deliberate on these particular issues. Uh, it can also meet at, uh, at the uh, permanent representative issue uh, level with the ambassadors from NATO. Then you have something called the high-level group, which is chaired by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for, uh, well, it, uh, global security now, but it was uh, international security policy. Um, and that brings officials from capitals to discuss specific issues related to our nuclear return. Then you have what was called the NPG staff group, which is the uh, at the first secretary level at NATO. That's a group that I chaired. And then for security issues regarding uh, nuclear weapons in Europe, we had something called the Joint Theater Security Management Group. And every one of these groups, at no time did anyone, did no country, anyone, suggest or propose the elimination of nuclear weapons in Europe. That had never happened at a NATO meeting that I'm aware of and didn't happen in, during the Deterrence and Defense Posture Review. I think it's important to make that point because, again, you, you hear a nation saying, well, we, we, we support the removal of these nuclear weapons, but they also recognize the importance of the transatlantic link that they represent. Uh, the burden sharing, uh, this, uh, again, this is uh, one of the slides I think is very important, that if, in fact, we ever deploy a, uh, a nuclear or go on a nuclear mission, up to 16 nations would be actively involved. It isn't just the nation that would fly the mission with uh, something called the dual capable aircraft, uh, aircraft that fly conventional and nuclear missions. It would be all of these countries actively participating. And this is part of the burden sharing uh, roles that they have assumed. This is just an illustrative example of uh, the uh, countries that would be actively involved in that mission. It, it isn't just one airplane with a bomb on it flying somewhere. Um, you also may hear people 
talk about the fact that uh, the DCA and these dumb bombs uh, stored somewhere in Europe have no military utility. Well, in response to that, I would point to you the 2008 Secretary of Defense Task Force on U.S. DOD Nuclear Weapons Management that called, as you see here, I won't read it, but this, as far as I know, is the only uh, study that has ever been done regarding the capabilities of DCA. I will tell you that uh, this capability is exercised and that our allies that actively participate uh, understand and know the military utility. If you look at the operation that we did in Libya, you had airplanes, F-16s and tornadoes that flew up to 1,500 nautical miles. So if you employed a nuclear mission in which these aircraft, dual capable aircraft, would fly up to 1,500 nautical miles, if you just draw an arc uh, from the uh, territory of the Alliance, you'll get some sense of what the capability actually is. It is exercise, it, is, it, it does have military utility, and I submit that part of its deterrence mission is to indeed be militarily useful. So those that argue uh, it doesn't have any military utility, all I ask is show me the study. And I haven't seen any study that would indicate otherwise as well. Uh, there is in the public fora this continuing debate about the presence of these weapons. Um, there, there certainly is no doubt about that, but in the process of deciding on our current posture, it, it's one that was... How many is there? 15. 15. You're at 15. Uh, I'm at 15, okay. <laughs> so I will wrap up as quickly as possible. But I, uh, I, I think it's important, though, again, if you read this, that, that number one, that any decision regarding uh, the change in force structure would have to be done by consensus. There's continuing concern by many of our allies about any changes that would reflect negatively on our deterrence posture, and that any changes certainly should be done at a minimum in an arms control process by having the Russians take so-called reciprocal steps by Russia, which uh, remain undefined. Um, so let me wrap up uh, with these observations that uh, the burden-sharing aspects of our alliance posture it remains critical. Um, that Indeed, there is a military utility of our current nuclear force structure in Europe that goes a long way to enhancing and maintaining our deterrence posture that uh, is, in fact, a, a reflection of the security concerns of the alliance um, that basically has now what I call a holistic deterrence posture that includes the conventional forces, nuclear forces, missile defense, and consequence management capabilities to address the full spectrum of threats that the Alliance sees uh, today. Um, these are the kind of questions that we addressed in the Nuclear Deterrence and Posture Review. Um, I'm out of time, so I won't go into any more detail, but I'd be happy to discuss that with questions uh, later. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's a tough topic. It's kind of a detailed topic, but uh, I think it's an important one. Thank you, Michaela. It is, as you saw as Guy went, went on, this is, a, this is a complex topic, it's not easy. Uh, some, of the, some of the initial aspects of the roles of nuclear weapons in the 21st century actually, actually are easy. I went back in preparation for this and looked through presidential documents and guidance over the last 40 years, and there is amazing consistency, uh, depending on whether the administration was, it didn't matter whether the administrations were Republican or Democrat, whether it was Cold War era or post-Cold War, all of the guidance documents included at least three roles and three objectives served by nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Those are to deter certain actions by specific adversaries, to help assure allies, including by extended nuclear deterrence, which, which Guy addressed in depth, and to prepare to respond in case deterrence fails. Deterrence is not guaranteed to work. And so we need to be prepared in the ever-changing world for its failure. And additionally, the flexibility to adjust the posture in whatever way is needed. There's great uncertainty, uh, and Rebecca talked about that in her remarks, in, in the world ahead. And we should not be surprised by the issue of, of, of uncertainty in the world. Uh, just two examples. Uh, in 1990, early 1990, we had no idea that just a year later, we were going to be uh, developing a deterrent strategy against Saddam Hussein's 
the use of chemical and biological weapons, and we were going to be deploying nuclear weapons to that region in a way that would, would back up our deterrence threats. No, no clue. Uh, things change quickly. As Guy talked about uh, NATO allies, we had no idea in the late 80s that the Baltic states and some of the other Eastern European states that were part of the non-Soviet Warsaw Pact that were considered uh, enemy be because it was Soviet controlled at the time, a few years later would be free and independent states, and a few years after that would be NATO allies, and that we would be guaranteeing through our Article 5 guarantees uh, deterrence against any action against those states and this quick turnaround. So the, there's great uncertainty ahead and we are in the process of planning a nuclear force for the decades ahead, which includes a, a ballistic missile submarine, a next generation SSGN, which is planned to be in service through 2080, almost seven decades in the future. And so that it tells us that we should be very flexible and we should uh, be, be careful in what we seek not to do. And that's what I want to talk about a bit more about today. Uh, my favorite strategist and historian is Colin Gray, and Colin has written a lot on how to plan in the face of uncertainty, and he boils, down, it boils it down to minimizing regrets, whatever happens. Well, it's not very helpful. We need a lot of details on that. How do you minimize regrets? Uh, I would assert there are at least two regrets that are possible with regard to nuclear weapons. One is having an insufficient number, and the second is having insufficient or, or, or the wrong types that, that either don't deter, don't assure allies, uh, don't help us if we need to, uh, to defend ourselves should, should deterrence fail. And so in that regard, I want to make, uh, I want to point out two areas in which I think the Obama administration is going down the wrong path. One is, is, is the area that Rebecca mentioned in cutting force structure. The, the force structure, the, uh, the missiles that will be cut as a result of the New START Treaty, and if, if the administration goes forward with further cuts, will be cuts to for, force structure, which will limit our ability to, to deploy increasing numbers in the future, and in a limited or in a timely fashion, without more than a decade or so delay while we build additional uh, forces. But the one that I am most concerned about, that I think most, is most damaging, and I've read very little, is the Obama administration's policy of no new nuclear weapon capabilities. This was a policy that was on the administration's website the first day they took office. No briefings, no debate, no, uh, no internal debate in the administration, and it was under the heading foreign policy agenda, and it was the objective move toward a nuclear-free world. It wasn't about national security. Uh, the policy was articulated again in the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, which stated that the Obama administration will not develop new nuclear warheads and that life extension programs will use only components based on previously tested designs and will not support, and this is the part, will not support new military missions or provide new military capabilities. This prohibition is without precedent. Uh, such, a, such a prohibition was discussed in, in the 90s. It was debated by the Strategic Posture Commission, and they agreed that that, that, go, that would be too far to go in their recommendations. And so, and, and I think this, this policy issue has kind of fallen on, on deaf ears, and we haven't responded to it, because there, there, there really isn't a compelling need right now for new military capabilities to be developed. But the problem is it, it's strangling innovation at the national laboratories on the design skills. And should those, should new capabilities be needed in the future, uh, those skills will not have been passed down from one generation to another. It's also a very difficult policy to implement. Uh, I see I have a Los, former Los Alamos colleague in the audience here, and I remember, he may remember also, that this issue came up in the 90s when the U.S. was in the process of considering developing the B-61 Model 11, taking the B-61-7 gravity bomb, putting it in a penetrator case. And I remember having a University of California official come because he thought we might be breaking the law by doing something different or new. There was no such, such law. 
and he demanded, pounded the table, that I tell him whether this was or was not a new military capability. Simple question. Well, here's the answer. It's not so simple. In the B-61 Model 11 modification, the U.S. took an existing, quote, not new, warhead, put it in a different, parentheses, new configuration in an, for an earth-penetrating weapon. It deployed it on the same not new delivery platform, the B-2, to, to achieve weapons effects on deep underground targets comparable, but not new, to effects that would be possible from the older high-yield gravity bomb that was to be retired. And the comparable not new effects on the same not new targets were to be achieved in a somewhat different but maybe new manner. And so then I, so, so you tell me, is it new or not? It's a silly example and it's legalistic, but it's the kind of things, the kind of arguments that we get into when we have a policy uh, on something that is, is poorly defined, is not new. Uh, some of you may have read a, an issue brief just written a few weeks ago, it came out of the Federation of American Scientists, and it came out right after the hearing on the B-61 Mod 11, and it was citing the administration's pledge of no new military capabilities, and it was saying, it's breaking its own, the administration's breaking its own pledge. The B-61 Mod 12 will be installed with a, a guidance kit that will improve accuracy, and standoff provided by, by some wings to keep the aircraft further away from the defenses and to, to uh, increase the survivability of the pilot and aircrew. Well, extremely legalistic. How do, how do you measure those things? In the time that the B-61 has been around, defenses have improved, so survivability of the aircrew has gone down. <coughs> Should we increase standoff only to keep the pilots alive, only to the level that defenses have improved, then we do have some calculation. It, we get into silly arguments over this not new issue, and it's extremely damaging. So, as I, my, my final, I know we're, we're getting a little bit late on time, but I want to just uh, stress that it, the importance of, of flexibility and resilience, the, the characteristics that the Bipartisan Nuclear Posture Review cited as the most important to, to be ready for the dynamic times ahead are extremely important ahead, and that the administration, the current administrations, for seeking re reductions in nuclear force structure, uh, limit its flexibility and its, its possibility that that might, that they actually might have to go in a different direction, go up for a few years because of some con uh, contingency in the future. And this policy of no new capabilities are very damaging to our security in the future because they really limit our capability to <coughs> respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we, we have a few minutes to take questions from the audience. Please introduce yourself, um, state your question, do not make very, very long comment, um, and please wait for the microphone. Questions? Okay. Jake, here in front. Thank you. I, I have my question is primarily about NATO. I'm sorry, Terry Campo, my former DOE guy. Uh, I was doing an interview last week and was asked a question that threw me. And the question was whether NATO is still essential to U.S. security. And as important as I think it was, I couldn't agree with the term essential. I'm wondering, uh, based on your comment, what you would say. Well, uh, I would, as a spending six years at NATO, I would say that our, that our alliance is essential. Uh, the and it goes all the way back to after World War II, basically, that our presence there uh, and, and having a physical presence there is important, uh, not just having a relationship uh, similar to what we have perhaps with Japan or South Korea, but actually um, having uh, a presence, a nuclear presence there that demonstrates that resolve. I think it's, uh, it's not just a holdover from the Cold War. Um, and especially from our new, the new nations, uh, I, I still remember being in, in Lithuania where the Deputy Minister of Defense took me out to the town, town, the town square and there's a plaque commemorating President Bush's speech that he said, in which he said, supposedly every kid in Lithuania knows this, that any, uh, any attack on Lithuania is an attack on the United States. Well, most Americans would say, where the hell is Vilnius? But, uh, but nevertheless, the, that reflection of that commitment and the importance
importance of uh, having allies uh, that are intertwined with the United States for their security as well as ours, I think, remains very vital. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's challenging, obviously, in this austere fiscal environment as we see our forces uh, diminished. But, uh, uh, but one of the things that um, I was told to me by several co former colleagues is that as we diminish our com conventional capabilities, um, the, the nuclear presence there, which is in, in comparison relatively low cost, uh, is more and more important. And we'll take one more question. I'm Zach Becker from Obsidian Analysis. Uh, why do you think that people who support deterrence have lost the, um, the branding? Why is deterrence no longer a brand that anybody cares about? I mean, I, I understand the whole, you know, the posture and all that kind of stuff, but for most of Americans are usually in the weeds, you know, it's like kind of like, to use a football term, what's a better defense, a 4-3 or 3-4? I mean, most more Americans don't care. But I think we can all, a lot of people will agree that deterrence is essential. But why can't we get that message out? If I could just, just let me start out. Uh, we, in our organization, we've been looking at, at the different views of allies regarding whether the source of the threat that they feel is the most severe, uh, how severe the threat is, and what they need in terms of assurance and extended deterrence. And looking at and it's really broad, very different, different views. One one common thread is is closeness to the threat. Uh, you know, the, for example, in the Pacific, the, uh, the ROK in Japan are really worried about the North Korean threat. Uh, the Australians, n not, m not so much. Uh, similarly with, with, with China. And so uh, I, I think, at least in the U.S., we enjoy a, uh, we are not, we don't have a threat on our borders other than the, the terrorist threat that we, we saw in 9-11 that we continue to focus on. And so much of the threat that we, for which deterrence is fashioned right now, from our perspective, is thousands of miles away. I'd like to keep it that way, but I, I think that's part of it, Zach, that, uh, that it's just not that immediacy, and there are other things to, for, that demand our time and attention. I just add one more point. I mean, I think from just my experience working on the Hill and then doing policy work after I left the Hill, you know, the American people, we, we've always been reluctant to be engaged militarily as just as a country, we've, we've been reluctant. And I think people just see, you know, nuclear weapons. And I've heard so many times people say, why do we have them if we're never gonna use them? And then to my response is always, we're using them right now. The whole point, the reason we have them while we want to maintain a robust um, and flexible nuclear force is because we, we actually wanna have a credible threat to use them, to employ them, so that we don't have to use them to employ them. And I think that that concept just, um, it, you know, people just have to be reminded that that's why we have them. And especially now, we've seen kind of this trend in our country where I wouldn't say it's, it's not isolationist, but it's kind of moving in that direction. We're kind of war weary. And so we want to we wanna cut down on, on defense spending in general. And then people just see nuclear weapons as something that, you know, why, why do we have them? And are they expensive? And, and the truth of the matter is comparatively they're not, especially for, for what they provide to our country. Um, but we just need to do a better job. We need to do a better job of explaining that. Um, actually, if you want peace and if you don't want to be provocative, that, that it's best for global security if the United States does have a credible uh, nuclear uh, capability. Yeah, thank you very much. We have Mr. Fortenberry here. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mr. Fortenberry was elected to U.S. House of Representatives in 2004 and serves Nebraska's first congressional district. His work in Congress is rooted in the belief that the strength of our nation depends on the strength of our families and of our communities. He is a member of the House Appropriations Committee, which appropriates um, U.S. government expenditures. He also serves on three subcommittees with importance for Nebraska, agriculture, military construction, veteran affairs, and legislative branch. Mr. Fortenberry previously served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where he placed particular focus on human rights concerns, Middle Eastern affairs, and nuclear weapons nonproliferation. He represented Nebraska on the Agriculture Committee, where his work on two farm bills advanced opportunities for young and beginning farmers and promoted agricultural entrepreneurship. Prior to serving in Congress, Mr. Fortenberry worked as a publishing industry executive in Lincoln, 
where, where he also served on the Lincoln City Council from 1997 to 2001. He has significant personal experience in small business, and early in his career, he worked as a policy analyst for the U.S. State Senate Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations. He earned bachelor, bachelor's degree in economics and two master's degrees, one of which is in public policy. He and his wife live in Lincoln and have five daughters. With that, please join me in welcoming Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you. Thank, you so Thank you. Welcome. Sorry I'm late. Well, thank you very much, Michaela, for the very kind introduction. I'm sorry we're running behind here. I understand I was supposed to go first, and we just finished our votes in Congress. Let me get to that last question. I think the 4-3 defense actually makes uh, some sense. You know, I'm from – actually, I'm pretending to know more about this than I actually do. But being from Nebraska and being very sensitive to defensive concerns at the moment is a real cultural <laughs> phenomenon uh, where I'm from. But I'm happy to be here with you all, and I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak with you. Again, because these were opening remarks, would it still be appropriate to, to, to give them? Okay. Yes. And I have another constraint, and it's called an airplane in an hour and 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to speed along. I wanted to begin with a, something that happened to me almost about two years ago. I went to uh, northern France in Normandy and uh, visited the American cemetery there. And uh, the wonderful people who run our cemetery uh, had a formal program put together for me as a member of Congress. And I said, look, that's really all right. Well, why don't we just go down to the beach? And I, I walked to the water's edge and stood there and looked at the hundreds of yards of op open beach here at Omaha Beach. And it's very difficult to get the mind around what ensued that day that 18 and 19-year-olds from New York to Nebraska, many of whom had never ventured 20 miles beyond where they lived, were asked basically to save civilization. And that's what they did, dashing across hundreds of yards of open beach in the face of machine gun fire and a hail of mortars, and then had to proceed up a steep hill cliff, steep cliff side. But they did that, and they finally won the day. And, after, and I proceeded along that beach and went to the hillside and stood in a machine gun bunker manned by a German soldier named Severlo, who uh, wrote a book on his experiences shortly before he died a few years ago. And apparently he continued his, to fire his weapon for hours straight, weeping as he did so, as this slaughter unfolded before him. Now, in Nebraska, where I'm from, there's a little town called Columbus, and at the entrance of the community, there is a park dedicated to our veterans. And it has one of the Higgins Boats troop carriers that was so instrumental in landing our troops there on, on D-Day. Andrew Jackson Higgins is, is from right there. And there are replicas of the men exiting the statue that create a real lifelike scenario for uh, the depiction of the momentous day that day. And it was really those 18 and 19-year-olds who unknowingly set up the construct for international stability for the next 60 years. Now, after World War II, the West was ravaged by war and malaise. The West looked to us, the United States, as a guardian of stability, freedom, and human dignity. And the United States was cast into this role of superpower. And it was, of course, as you all are aware, the beginning of the Cold War era, democracy versus communism, where these two different ideologies were in fierce combat over what was going to be the very trajectory of humanity and governance. That fight is largely over, but the residue does remain. Now we are experiencing a rapid shift in the post-World War II construct for international stability. Globalization, with its advances in transportation, communications and development have altered fragile power balances, creating new quasi-governmental structures for humanity that actually transcend national boundaries. The old model of trying to simply out-muscle the Russians and the Chinese no longer fully applies. Now, the good news is that, in regards to nuclear weapons, we, we find ourselves in a less, less nuclear, nuclearized world today. There are nine countries with nuclear weapons. At the height of the Cold War, 56 countries had highly enriched uranium that could be used to produce the weapons. Now there are 29. And thanks to the Nunn-Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, the number of countries that have fissile material has also decreased significantly. 
Now, in this context, we must work to ensure that our nuclear posture can robustly address the new challenges of the 21st century, including potential asymmetric threats that were once inconceivable. The stakes are very high. Perhaps we did not envision the complexity we now face back when the size of relief came about at the presumed end of the Cold War. Now, the bad news is that Iran is on the verge of having a nuclear weapons capability. We may face a nuclear arms race in the Middle East if Iran gets closer to developing a weapon. And this technology is at ready disposal. Now, let's project out 30 years from now. How do you control the marketplace for nuclear technology and prevent the unthinkable? Today's challenge involves more than a determination about the, the, the level of weapons necessary for deterrence as conceived against the Soviet Union. It involves an examination of the essence of deterrence within the framework of a holistic national security construct that encompasses international development, diplomacy, and a robust conventional and nuclear defense posture built in tandem with these other elements. Nuclear weapons in the 21st century cannot be viewed in isolation. Mechanisms for national security and defense are not static floor plans. Rather, as the former commander of the United States Strategic Command, General Robert Kaler, once described it, mechanisms for security and defense are more akin to living ecosystems. Our strategic posture and important nonproliferation efforts, including interdiction, assessing our inventory of fissile materials worldwide, strengthening forensics capability, protecting critical infrastructure, strengthening and broadening alliances, all go hand in hand. We also have huge budgetary concerns and some serious questions to ask ourselves. What type of nuclear infrastructure is necessary to deter the use of nuclear weapons in view of today's international challenges? How many weapons do we need? Beyond the strategic component, what is our level of commitment to nonproliferation and cooperative threat reduction? Large issues like this take coherent and continuous deliberation. When I was in graduate school, there was an eminent professor of philosophy who was visiting the school. I had heard about some of his work. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Zeifert, can you give me the philosophical arguments for the immortality of the soul? And he said, Jeff, this is a very good question. And I'm actually lecturing on this Thursday and Friday nights. You are more than welcome to come. I said, Professor Zeifert, that is a very kind invitation. Your lectures are three hours, both on Thursday and Friday nights. I, I was hoping that perhaps you could give me a little summarized version. And in his wonderful German accent, he said to me, you asked me a question about immortality, but you do not have the time. <laughs> we are facing existential threats, but no one seems to have the time. This is, there is a limited incentive in Congress to work on complex issues such as nuclear deterrent. Sad but true. The immediate concerns and, and tyranny of the urgent are all that occupy the minds of, and schedules of today's lawmakers. But we, we have been making some headway in pressing this point in the House. Together with my colleague Adam Schiff from California, we established a Congressional Nuclear Security Working Group to raise awareness and strengthen nuclear security policy considerations. Now, at a recent event that we hosted, uh, there was a panel, which Rebecca was kind enough to, to join us on, panel of experts, and one was Tom Caracco, a former Armed Services Committee staff member who now teaches at Kenyon College. Tom had a very uh, good, astute observation, defining deterrence as psychology, communications, and force, force strength. And traditional deterrence has relied on these elements. But I do think this definition can be expanded. Other components of deterrence are economic interlinkages, international resolve, and the threat of economic sanctions. The question is of what, what constitutes deterrence today in of itself argues for a strong engagement either way by Congress and the administration on matters of nuclear security. Congress must also engage constructively with the executive branch to ensure that our national security rests on multifaceted foundations. We need a more deliberate and complete process to make important strategic considerations. For example, let's take a look at the President's speech in Berlin. Late one evening in last June, I received a surprise call from the Pentagon. No one on my staff knew the nature of the call. 
the Department of Defense was told to inform a select group of members of Congress about an announcement the President was making that day. Like many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, I was caught off guard that the President used his address at Brandenburg Gate to make a broad and sweeping change to our foreign policy and security posture. Don't get me wrong, I was grateful for the call. That's a very important improvement. But on matters of such import, a more deliberative process would provide better order to serious proposals. Now, successive presidents have called for a world without nuclear weapon, which is an important and laudable goal. We should remind ourselves that the purpose of nuclear weapons is to prevent their use. A delicate balance has held, but it is fragile. We should also remember that we have the world's most formidable nuclear capability, but what about tomorrow's defense needs? So before sudden decisions about increasing or decreasing the size of our arsenal are made, we need to have that fundamental discussion about what kind of deterrent and even what kind of military we will have in the 21st century. Furthermore, we need to decide how these elements fit with economic interdependency worldwide, cultural linkages, and communication advances that are the primary drivers now in global relationships. This is particularly true now that we're winding down in the Middle East and South Asia and have been pivoting to the Pacific, according to the President. This pivot, by the way, has received very little congressional consideration. A little while back, I was on one of our key pieces of national security infrastructure, let me just put it that way, and we were visiting with the crew with one of our nation's top generals. And some questions came up, and there was a young crew member on this piece of defense architecture this apparatus, and uh, the general I was with stopped. And he said to her, where are you from? And she paused, and she said, sir, do you mean where I was born? And it caught the general a little bit off, off guard, and he said, well, sure, where, where are you from? Where were you born? And again, she hesitated. Now, this is a, a night probably about a 19-year-old who has joined the Air Force and is now being approached by a four-star general and a member of Congress randomly. Perhaps a little bit of intim intimidation there. But she kind of cautiously answered his question when he said, where were you born? She said, Russia. Now the general just kind of half smiled and said, well, that's about the most unexpected answer I could have heard. Then he went on to say, I can almost guarantee that the Russian general, when reviewing his troops and asked one of his personnel where they're from, he never hears the answer, America. <laughs> then he looked at the young woman and said, what made you join the Air Force? And she said, sir, I was adopted. And I wanted to give something back to the country that gave me a chance. Now, there's an American value. That's the core source of our strength. That's the core way in which we project power worldwide. Thank you all so much. Look forward to your any questions that you might have. Yes. Hi, Congressman. Michael Bruno with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, to the degree that Washington does talk about nuclear issues, there's talk is, there is here about force structure. But there still doesn't seem to be much talk about usage. And many analysts, or as the analysts we cover, increasingly fear that this century could see the use, an aggressive use of a nuclear weapon somewhere. Does Congress have a role in deciding actual usage and whether there should be a tit-for-tat, you know, exchange if a weapon is used somewhere, should the U.S. fire one, or is that still best left in the President's domain? You're talking about academically or in reality? <laughs> uh, academically, it's the President's decision, or in reality, it's the President's decision as I understand it. It's solely his decision. Now, academically, I agree with you, it's probably a good question for us to unpack, to think about, again, how do you obviously prevent the inevitable, or if there are scenarios in which you, in reality, have to face, what is the, um, the options available to you to ensure that damage is as limited as possible? But I uh, am not aware of active ongoing discussion in that regard. Generally, 
the domain of the Defense Department and the executive branch. Next question. I'm Joseph Wolf Summer. I work for TASC, which uh, advises DTRA on some issues, and I worked with Guy Roberts for some years. Uh, some members of far, uh, your counterparts in foreign uh, houses of representatives have made some advances towards some of your members. I, this summer there was a Dutch representative who presented a letter to Representative Turner, who used to be on the uh, Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I believe, uh, which is an unusual step. Have you received any advances such as that requesting uh, that we cease our participation in the nuclear mission in Europe? And, and just acade speaking of academically yeah. and, real and in reality, if you did, uh, how would you tend to react? Thank yeah, and, and it's, it's a good question, and uh, let me back up and say that strategic uh, force structure subcommittee would very well have more of those deliberations in answer to the earlier question. I'm just not on that committee and have not had that level of interaction myself. So I'm, I'm not giving you a complete answer in, in regards to the gentleman's earlier question. I think what's happening interestingly internationally is there is more desire for parliamentary to parliamentary dialogue rather than executive, or not as opposed to, but to augment executive to ex executive dialogue, rather than the leader or the elected official or the autocracy at the top making decisions for a country, particularly in transparent republics or democracies. There is more of a desire for, again, because of the advances in the 21st century in communications and travel particularly, this uh, development of understanding and policy dialogue between lawmakers themselves in the domain of foreign policy that has traditionally been left to the executive. Um, I find it very interesting and uh, fruitful, honestly, and uh, purposeful, and continue to pursue that. And I think it, it makes a contribution to the robust debate as to what foreign policy ought to look like. Now, we have a long tradition in our country that used to be, used to hold, it used to be somewhat sacrosanct, but it is now a bit under stress that we debate policy all we want, but when it comes to our shores, we stop and we get behind the president. Now, there is still a, a significant reasons to, to hold that sentiment and that view, and in times of crisis, I'm sure we all would. But in terms of uh, exchange of ideas, there is a more robust option, opportunity, for dialogue between uh, parliamentarians and legislators. In regards to the specifics of your question, no, I've never received anything like that. However, we've talked some about, for instance, the possibility of a transatlantic uh, trade agreement. And this is very interesting to the Europeans particularly, and Europeans are obviously more uh, engaged in uh, international or sensitized to international dialogue and foreign affairs as a top of their agenda than we are. Um, so I've warned my European counterparts and friends, this is not on the top of the United States agenda. But if you start to think about what the possibilities are in terms of ec further economic interdependency, that could be beneficial to both people. Do you start re-examining other questions about military posture and making those potentially more robust? The first one would be, you got to pay your dues to NATO, and uh, that would be you know, one of the concerns that I would lay down. But the other being that if we're establishing uh, criteria for order, more order and regularity in commerce, does the same apply in terms of uh, labor standards and perhaps environmental standards? That actually creates a set of values, of values propositions between one billion people in the world that starts to look like this makes, this type of ordering makes sense. It is dependent upon uh, civil society, in effect, being functional. But if we sign up, if we're a country in Africa or Central or South America, we sign up for that, do we fall under the sphere of this broader influence of people that would be, then be well over a billion and start to counter leverage other trends in the world that are despotic, that use economics to uh, repress, that sell off uh, resources for immediate gain with no consideration of, of, of the environment? And so then suddenly you also, I think, have the door open to broadening the, the, the possible alliance that, that, that is related to defense and military posture and even nuclear security questions. 
So this is just, again, way down the road in the academic world, but some of the types of discussions that take place between members of different parliaments. Uh, I welcome it, uh, to be honest. Uh, again, in times of crisis, I, I would certainly believe it is important to rally around, rally around our commander in chief. And I would imagine that would be the sentiment of 535 members of, of Congress. Um, but again, new advances in this modern age create, I think, some real significant opportunities to develop better processes for mutual understanding, more linkages that are beneficial to both persons. And that is part of this ecosystem, I think, that uh, we need to consider when we're looking at d defense posture in the, in the future. Can you please join me in thanking Mr. Fortenberry and our panelists. Thank you, everyone.